to our call um, for our anti-racism group. I'm just going to admit someone from the waiting room. Okay. okay so I'm, I'm sorry. I'll take care of that. Don't worry. Okay. All right. Got it. All right. So yes. Yeah, so welcome. I hope everyone's doing well. So um, I'll just give kind of a quick overview and then we can all introduce ourselves because we have a relatively small group. Can everybody hear me okay? Actually, could, do you have earbuds or something? Your sound quality is kind of scratchy. I do, yeah, I had to go get it them. Would, it would take a minute. It would really make it much better quality and anyone sure, else is willing to do the same. Yeah, I can grab some, hold on one second. Thank you. If you're just joining us, we're just getting started while our panelists grab some earbuds. Be right back. All right, now let's try this again. Is that better? Thank you so much. It's better? Yes. Okay, good, good. All right. At least what I've heard so far. <laughs> okay, excellent. Just let me know if you can't hear me. Um, so my name is Grace Walter. I am a second year family medicine resident at Georgetown in Washington, DC. Um, and I'm one of the national co-chairs on the gun violence prevention uh, committee at Doctors for America. So welcome to this meeting. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, we can just go ahead and get started. Um, so if people wanna go ahead and introduce themselves, um, you can just unmute yourself and then introduce yourself to the group, just kind of say where you're from and what institution you're with and why you wanted to join us this evening. So can I just ask, you said gun violence prevention and the announcement I said have says anti-racism curriculum. Yeah. Now I know those two are closely related. Yep, so the gun violence prevention group is kind of spearheading this effort within Doctors for America, but it's much wider than just the gun violence prevention aspect. Do you want me to go? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> I'm Marcia Silver. I'm a, a retired nephrologist, emeritus professor of medicine at Case Western Reserve. And um, I have a little more time now, so I'm happy to work on this. It's very important. I, I can go and then I'll tag other people. How's that? Okay, that's perfect. Um, I'm Rebecca Jones. I'm a, a dermatologist in Vermont, and uh, I was um, I was an early participant in DFA back in 08 or 09. Um, I've been away for a while, but I've been <clears throat> working on some uh, a task force in my in the town of Brattleboro, um, working on uh, racial equity, particularly around COVID. But it's expanded, so it's very exciting and. Um, and I'm thrilled to be on this call. So thanks for having me. And I am going to tag Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly. I use she, her, her pronouns. I'm a fourth year medical student at UC Irvine in Southern California, going into family. Um, I helped create the anti-racism curriculum at my school. So that's what I'm offering today. And we also developed a uh, region-wide um, allyship curriculum for basically non-Black people. Um, so I'd be happy to offer some of those pieces of curricula to the conversation today. I'll popcorn to Sheila. Hi guys, my name is Sheila. Um, I am a current PAVES chief resident at WashU in St. Louis. Um, and I am interested because we don't have an anti-racism curriculum and obviously desperately need one. So I'm really interested in, in hearing what Kelly, you and others have managed to implement at your institutions and also um, how you get buy-in from leadership who maybe, maybe doesn't recognize the need. Oh, sorry. And I will popcorn to um, William is the next person on my list. Hey everyone, I'm William, he, him pronouns. <clears throat> I am a second year resident at Yale in psychiatry. Um, we have a, what I think is an excellent um, anti-racism curriculum in our psychiatry program. 
um, called the Social Justice and Health Equity um, curriculum that's longitudinal over the course of our training. Um, but I'm joining more specifically as a steering committee member for DFA Connecticut because I think our DFA organization is not very diverse um, and I would very much like to change that um, and do a better job as an ally um, through my work with DFA. Um, popcorn, Rebecca Jones. I already went. So I will say- um, <laughs> Sorry about that. It's a no problem. Uh, is it Oneida or Onita? It's Oneida, thanks Rebecca. Um, I'm Oneida Arosarina. I'm a professor of otolaryngology at Temple University in uh, Philadelphia. I'm also associate dean for diversity and inclusion there. And um, while we do have a social determinants of the social determinants of health thread through our curriculum, we don't really have an anti-racism curriculum, and that's why I wanted to be on this call. Thank you so much. Nicole, would you like to go? Sure. Hi, I'm Nicole Economou. I'm the second year um, family planning fellow um, at UC San Diego within the department of OBGYN. I um, am on the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee with ACOG, which is newly formed this year. And we're working on a number of different equity initiatives as well as anti-racism initiatives. I'm personally very interested in medical education. So Kelly, I think I need to pick your brain about the region-wide <laughs> resources that you developed at Irvine. Um, especially for medical students and, and resident education as well. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, and I'm trying to see who else didn't speak. I think Ahmed, the next one. Hi guys. Uh, so my name is Ahmed Lebrano. I um, uh, am a fellow um, in um, global health capacity building over at Yale. Um, and so um, I am interested in uh, kind of this anti-racism curriculum um, for multiple reasons. I think one out of uh, personal interest, um, you know, and how, you know, secondly, how kind of anti-racism health inequity kind of relates to global health, um, but also um, uh, from the internal medicine side of things at Yale, um, while we do have um, a global health and equity concentration, there is actually, uh, there are some of my colleagues that are trying to develop um, uh, a new kind of concentration in um, sort of anti-racism um, and, um, and and these kinds of topics. And so, you know, I, I, I sort of wanted to also check in and see kind of what the conversation has been um, everywhere else and see if we can uh, sort of collaborate and bring some ideas to help us develop um, something here. Um, and I guess it's, it's popcorn, so uh, I'm not sure. Let's see, has uh, Mr. Ritterman, has he gone yet? <laughs> uh, Dr. Ritterman, you're, you're, you're on mute. On mute. You can find the unmute button. Hi, how are you? I just uh, added myself to the discussion. Um, Great. I'm I'm a little late coming on. No problem. We're just introducing yourself, please, and say what your specialty is and where you are practicing or what you're up to. Uh, so I'm a retired cardiologist from uh, Kaiser Richmond in Richmond, California. Used to be on the Richmond City Council and I'm on the board of directors of San Francisco Physicians for Social Responsibility. And uh, we've been working uh, on racial equity um, and uh, have uh, a little bit of an alliance with the Ella Baker Center, uh, working on policing and militarism as a public health crisis. Wonderful. I'll introduce myself. I, my name is Allison Volkman. I work at DFA. I'm on staff. I'm the back end logo of DFA here. I usually am off camera for these because I make weird faces as I take notes. But uh, pleasure to work with all of you and to meet you all. And um, if you have not yet introduced yourself, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you. 
Um, hi everyone, my name is Sarah Iqbal. I am a PGY1 emergency medicine resident at Southern Illinois University. Um, I'm uh, in Springfield, Illinois, um, and I'm working with my program um, to uh, really incorporate more of an anti-racist curriculum. Um, I've done a lot of this work in medical school, um, but now that I'm at a new program um, and kind of starting fresh, um, I would be really interested in just learning what resources there are out there and um, forming these partnerships and alliances going forward. Hi everyone, I'm Seema Menon. I am um, a, a faculty member at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. I'm an OBGYN. Um, my specialty is actually pediatric adolescent gynecology, but my um, interest is health disparities, um, specifically birth outcome. Our, the city I live in is Milwaukee and we have um, some of the widest um, birth outcome disparities specifically related to infant mortality. So we've been, um, formally incorporating disparities into our medical education, into our resident education, really trying to introduce um, concepts of health equity when we discuss, you know, when we go through our M&Ms, but we haven't really had a formal anti-racism curriculum and it's something that a lot of us want to do. So I'm really just here for, for ideas and I'm excited to hear what some of you guys have done because it sounds like there's some people that have really gotten a, a good start on things. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I think everyone's introduced themselves, correct? May I ask a question? Yeah. A number of people have, have used the term allies and I haven't used it. I haven't heard it used in this way before. Would someone please define it? So a definition of allyship for us, if I could offer that, um, we like to use the terms ally and, and accomplice pretty readily in this work. It's the idea that this work is not just being done by those that are immediately affected. So if we're thinking about anti-racism work, then we would hope that those that exist in the majority act as allies. Um, in, our allyship, in our allyship series that we outlined, um, and this was actually through the Student National Medical Association in region one, which is kind of the entire I-5 corridor. So think the entire West Coast. Um, we invited non-Black and Indigenous students to learn about how they can engage in anti-racism work as non-Black and Indigenous students um, and professionals. Accomplice is a term that we use. It's a little bit more action-oriented. Instead of just being aware of the issues and knowledgeable about what's wrong, you're taking active steps to engage in this work um, or to actively fight against racism. I can take a lot of different forms, but those are the two terms that we utilize and, and hope to see from our non-Black, non-minoritized colleagues. I think she's muted. There Sorry. You is there a difference? Be is it okay if I pursue this for one more question? Yeah, go ahead, sure. Um, um, Kelly, you, you, you're explaining things very nicely. Thank you. Um, what's the difference between um, uh, an upstander and an, I guess, and an ally and, a, and an accomplice? Because that's another term I've heard, but I've never, I, I haven't been able to, to get a really good definition of that or what it means to be an upstander. You know, I'm not sure either. I, I have, haven't really heard upstander used in this context a ton. If anyone can chime in there, I, I welcome it. it. It's but like a bystander, but someone who speaks up to intervene when okay. they observe racist actions. So sure. it sounds to me like you're talking about similar kind of action, support yeah. and appropriate behavior and I've heard people say what's not appropriate and what is appropriate and I am still not clear on what what is the accepted wisdom on this subject uh, mm. so 
Well, I can at least just drop a definition in the chat box that's been really lovely um, that we've used pretty continuously. The Anti-Oppression Network offers a really good definition of allyship that I think we can ground ourselves in if it's helpful. And I just dropped it in the chat here. Thank you. All right. That's Yeah, thank you for that. That's helpful to know all those differences. Um, Allison has dropped the agenda in the chat. And so our next kind of thing is to just overview what Dr. Sir America has been doing so far and then kind of get your input on that as well. Um, and then we'll kind of move into like a little bit more of an interactive um, kind of workshop type thing. So at DFA, we've been working on this for a couple of months now, just um, kind of brainstorming how we can get this into medical schools, residency training programs, and just medical institutions in general. Um, and Kind of our goals for the project so far are to create a toolkit of resources and Allison has put the toolkit that we've started it's not exhaustive by any means but we um, kind of went through and looked at various institutions that had their toolkits or their curriculum already posted online um, and also looked at some professional organizations this is not exhaustive like I said so um, we're hoping that you guys can help us with this toolkit and kind of get this put together um, and if you open the toolkit, you can see a lot of um, different institutions have at least some form of this um, curriculum or toolkit posted on their website. Um, so we're definitely not alone in doing this work, but we want to get it pushed out to as many institutions as possible. Um, so then the second part of our kind of goals for this project is to design a national webinar, um, and that would be you know, talking about systemic racism, why it's important to teach this to medical professionals, um, how they can incorporate it into their schools, but also, you know, just, just have a discussion about racism and um, how it impacts patients, healthcare professionals, everyone. Um, so that would be the second part of our kind of overview for the project. Um, just wanted to kind of open it up to see what you guys think. I know a lot of people on this call have a lot of experience in getting this uh, curriculum into medical schools um, and residency programs and in their institutions. So I'll just open it up for questions or suggestions if you guys have anything right off the bat. I can just um, mention that um, the local hospital that um, I am sort of under the auspices of, it's not a teaching hospital, but I've been working on a curriculum for the, um, the acting physicians there. And um, it's, I can tell there's receptivity, but it's, it's hard. And so this is really exciting because I feel like I can say, here, look, <laughs> this is this other thing we can do. So I, I just, I'm really excited about this and I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. I think that has been something that we've been trying to do as well. It, it can be difficult to kind of get um, people on board with this and kind of change their curriculum. So I think showing them our goal with the toolkit is hopefully to be able to show various institutions what is available to them, like resources that they could use as well and kind of make it as easy as possible. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, at my medical school, um, when I was there, um, we had um, I wouldn't necessarily call it an anti-racist uh, curriculum, but we um, had a group of my peers and I who were passionate about diversity and inclusion and saw that, you know, we were all having um, certain experiences that we weren't able to, to really talk about um, and share. Um, and with that, um, we came together to, build this um, coalition um, within our medical school that would, um, that's purpose was to serve as a platform and a safe space to hold um, these conversations that uh, were um, kind of difficult to, um, to have. And one of the things that I realized um, in this process was um, in the early stages of um, our organization, um, it was really difficult to get people to um, be receptive of what we were trying to do and trying to create the space and 
getting people not only to be interested, uh, but also promote it. And this is um, people who aren't actively, who aren't actively engaged in the creation of this organization. Um, but what I found to be helpful was having that working group uh, um, in our institution um, that was able to um, form um, a vision of what we wanted to carry forward and um, create goals and um, specific events that we would um, host. And once we had those events, we would collect some data and present that to, you know, administration to kind of get more support for our organization. And um, it took a while, but with more and more events, we grew a larger base. Um, and when the support comes from um, within and you start to develop more of that culture of, uh, and the space of, being able to talk about um, all of these different issues, um, we, I found that it was easy, easier for us to, to push some of our initiatives um, and get them um, more, not necessarily accepted, but get more people passionate about it and wanting to help, so. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I think that's important to, you know, just having that maybe core group at the school or the institution to kind of move this forward. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, this is, this no, is, okay. um, I was just going to say, you know, it, it is, it's such a great step to have a tool kit. Um, our institute where I work, our institution um, has a toolkit. I think um, what's been difficult is, is knowing how to move the toolkit forward, you know, like it's great to know. And I think, um, you know, people that appreciate it, appreciate it and, and people that don't really kind of know the value of it, you know, it's very easy to bypass. Um, so for me, I think the question is, how do you, how do you move this forward? And especially to, to people that maybe don't, you know, aren't really seeing the value of this or the need for this. I can share an experience we had at the hospital. Um, and uh, Sarah, is it Sarah or Sarah? Sorry. Oh, it's Sarah. Sarah it's the emphasis you. is on the first syllable. <laughs> Thanks. Um, as Sarah said, um, you know, building that coalition, which is, you know, it can be painstaking sometime, but getting the people to come together is so helpful. And what we did <clears throat> was bring in. Um, uh, a local member of the NAACP to speak. We had a Zoom call with doctors and I mean, he's wonderful anyway. And he just was so good at getting people talking about their experiences of, of what their understanding of racism was. It, basically just getting the conversation going and getting doctors who were maybe shy, but interested to come together and start talking. And, you know, it just, it was, it was that first step and it was, it really was very helpful. So I think finding folks um, in the area that you can bring in um, even outside the medical system can be very valuable. Yeah, I would echo that sentiment. I think that's kind of our goal with the national webinar too. Um, and, you know, potentially could be done on a smaller scale for interested institutions. Um, obviously we'd have to kind of plan that out with specific institutions, but I think that's a really good idea as well. So thanks for sharing that. Does anybody else have any thoughts? Yeah, um, one of the well, things that for us is having a consistent meeting time where people could drop in. So instead of something I wanna offer to you, Grace, is instead of doing a one-time webinar, offering it as a series, we're gonna offer a six to 7 p.m. Eastern on Thursdays for the next six weeks. And it, pulls in some of those more timid voices because you know there's like if even if I miss this one webinar there's still another chance to engage also longitudinal engagement worked a lot better for us in designing anti-racism curricula within the school of medicine and then this allyship series that we hosted um if it was a consistent time where people knew that they could tune in to talk about these things people tended to be a little bit more open to engaging um it also made sure that it was accessible for people outside of just your institution so 
we intentionally hosted a lot of our anti-racism anti curricular pieces later in the day. The allyship series only happened at 6.30 p.m. And um, you could pull in the, not just students that self-selected, but also some of the hesitant faculty, staff, people. So that would be my first recommendation is, is offering it as a series that's on a, at a consistent time. The second thing that I wanna offer is that data actually does work. To your point, Sara, um, we had to make the case too. And um, that's why we published some of the work that we're doing. And so we're in the publishing process, certainly for the um, allyship series and have gone through a couple hoops to publish some of our anti-racism curriculum work. But for some reason, medical education decides that something is more valid when it's in a journal. Can't, I, I don't know why, um, but it does. And so I would really, really leverage the literature that says X, Y, and Z type of education tends to produce X, Y, and Z outcomes in terms of health. Um, the, that having more diverse schools of thought in medical education, I keep thinking in med school land, but having more diverse schools of thought in medical education tends to breed more positive patient interactions, et cetera, because that literature exists. And I think that might be something that you wanna put together as a part of this toolkit. If you're gonna offer information, part of what the Student National Medical Association also offered were templates that you can use to send to your institution saying, we need to be doing this. And it was also a, um, a list of like why this works. And that tended to be a little bit more fruitful for us. So those are my two recommendations. First, having it as a series instead of a one-time offering that's at a standard time after work where people can access it. And two, using literature to back up any type of we should be doing this that you send to higher ups. Um, so, so do you have a one. reference list to share I, with us? Um, so yeah, I can do that. Um, but also don't make money your first ask. That's another <laughs> thing that I learned pretty quickly when you're approaching institutions. Um, not making your case around, and that's why we need $5,000. Um, instead, appealing to stories and narratives um, was really positive for us, but I can certainly drop some stuff in the chat. Yeah, that was super helpful. Thanks for all of that. I love the idea of doing a webinar series. We would have to kind of figure out who, you know, we'd have to make sure that we had enough of an audience, I think, but I think we could probably between all of us do something like that. I think that would be really great and engaging people. Um, and then the second thing that I think you mentioned was like a template to send out to these places. And we, that's something that we've been talking about as well. So I think that would be super helpful um, for having like, if people wanna present this kind of to their institution, having a templated way to make it easy for people to do so, I think would be really helpful. So actually, if you click on one of the links, there's um, a link in the agenda and there's a, sign up thing, which you guys may have already done, but there's a part on there that says um, deliver toolkit to your own medical institutions. And then it says, yes, send me a templated letter inviting medical institutions. So that is something that we're going to look out for. So I, I think that's super helpful. So thanks for that. And then also, Kelly, if you want to put your resources into the toolkit, you can do that. I think everyone should have edit access to that. So you guys can add to that as much as you would like. Thank you for sharing. Did somebody else have something they were going to say? Well, um, oh, uh, you wanted to say something, Grace? Oh, no, no, go ahead. Question. Um, sure. So, um, and this might be answered later. Is for those of you who've had some, you know, success applying these curriculums, um, do you find that? having a curriculum for faculty and then having a curriculum for the students and residents and trainees, it should it be two separate pathways versus um, something altogether? What, what is just, what has worked? I can, I can anticipate tension if there was all one group, um, but I just, I'm curious about the experiences with that. So um, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, in some of the sessions that um, we've hosted in the past, um, they were, I wouldn't say that it was part of the formal curriculum, but we um, tried to, to provide, um, you know, a topic of discussion. Um, and we had, uh, we did do like a, a series um, for these discussions. So it was something that was monthly, um, if we could, bi-weekly. Um, and at those sessions, um, 
I, and I think this is partly because it was maybe not part of the formal curriculum, but uh, more of just like a, a dinner kind of work group um, or forum that we would have. We ended up getting a mix of both faculty, administration, students, all who came together. Um, and by doing so, I think, you know, I didn't, I didn't necessarily feel um, any of that tension, um, at least in my own personal experience. Um, it seemed like everyone who was there was willing to learn from each other and kind of respected each other's experiences. A thing that helped us was that we would come up with um, like group rules on how we wanted to carry forward this discussion. Um, and I think that's something that helped um, because uh, everyone had, um, or it provided people the opportunity to have a say um, in what it, was, what it would take to create that safe space for people to come together and freely share ideas. Um, so, you know, just in my own personal experience, um, I didn't really have, um, you know, any tension amongst the, the, the different um, groups or levels of learners that we had. And it seemed like everyone valued each other's experiences and kind of um, was able to benefit from seeing each other's perspectives. So. Um, uh I have a few ideas I'd like to uh, just throw out. One is um, I think we ought to be a question or of reparations into the discussion because I think it's essentially impo impossible to close the health gap without closing the wealth gap. And um, reparations is a pretty unpopular idea right now. But um, I think the, uh, those of us in, in healthcare ought to be adding that to our critique and our discussion. The other is, and it's more for graduate medical education, um, I think we should be talking about mandatory um, training in uh, combating uh, medical racism as a necessity to maintain your license. Um, uh, when um, end of life care and pain management were things that uh, were found uh, that doctors were lacking in, um, in a lot of states, uh, they became mandatory to train in. So I think a similar argument can be made in combating medical racism. And I think that uh, that's something that we ought to be articulating in the work as well. And um, I put a, an article I wrote in the chat about uh, um, the radical impacts of discrimination. Basically part of the discussion of how racism affects biology important length. It, um, it prevents the dipping of nocturnal blood pressure, essentially racism um, follows you into your sleep and your dreams and prevents you from getting, uh, recharging your batteries when you're asleep. And, you know, th there, are, there are a lot of aspects to that. So um, I think that uh, another aspect to the discussion of, uh, uh, how how racism in, impacts us, um, you know, it's it's health access, it's all of that. And, and the other area where um, I think it's essential to look at and where I think race uh, intersects um, uh, health care and health perhaps as much as anywhere else is in the treatment of sickle cell disease. Um, there's a, a long history of patients with sickle cell disease uh, being mistreated in emergency rooms, being seen as drug addicts, and so on and so forth. And there's a lot in the literature about that. 
I would also like to mention, uh, for those of you who may not know, that the ACGME has developed a set of core competencies around uh, anti-racism. And um, I know faculty around the country were asked to comment on them. I certainly did. Um, I think we need to pressure the ACGME to, uh, to make those mandatory now uh, for, for all residencies in this country. And I think the AAMC has to come up with a similar set of core competencies for medical school students. Yeah, agreed. Thank you both for bringing up your points. Those are very important. One thing with the ACGME, um, this has come up at like Doctors for America meetings that we had before this um, about that as well and how to approach them with this. And I'm sure they've been approached, but I don't know all of the ins and outs of that. I don't know if anybody here has any ideas about that, but um, it's definitely something that is very important in getting this really incorporated into every curriculum. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts to share? I, you guys are, please add your resources to that document too, so we all can look at them if you don't mind doing that and we'll just add to our toolkit. Um, but if nobody else, yeah, go ahead. Um, so uh, feel free to argue with me, but I feel like we've been uh, talking about this for a really long time and that it's very hard to change people's attitudes and even behavior. But what really needs to be done is to legislatively go after the social determinants of health, starting with <laughs> Medicare for all, the universal healthcare system. And, and um, the, the yeah. physicians for a long time have said, oh, well, we don't, talk, we don't talk about politics, right? So we're all being really radical just being here. Uh, by that standard, but some organizations have, uh, I mean, that's of course not true because at least the old AMA opposed many efforts to expand um, medical care coverage. Um, and I think they're moving in a better direction I'm an internist and nephrologist, so the American, I'm very proud of the American College of Physicians, which has taken a much more, um, a much stronger position in terms of supporting uh, a just medical care system. And um, I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I mean, I think it's everything that everybody else has said is so important. And yet, to my mind, if everybody had the same admission ticket, a lot of this other stuff would, would, would start to change a little more rapidly. Because right now, hospitals are businesses and every patient is looked at as a customer and if you have a first class ticket or a second class ticket or a third class ticket, it makes a difference is, is to what kind of customer, how valued you are as a customer. Um, am I making any sense? I'll stop there. So Ben, yeah, say I, something. Yeah, Ben, do you have something to add? I think what you said makes perfect sense. Um, Allison also put in the chat kind of DFA's mission if anyone hasn't seen it, but yes. That is a very important point, I think, that you brought up. Ben, do you have anything to add? If not, if you do, that's fine. Well, you're saying that DFA, that that's part of DFA's mission, right? There is, um, uh, so there's different working groups within DFA and there is one for that, yes. So it is, yeah. But, Allison, but I don't know if I'm you wanna chime in about that as well. Oh, go ahead, Ben, sorry. Oh, I just wanted to say that I had nothing to say and I'm just okay. emphatically agree. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, I think, so I think part of the, I totally agree that legislative changes is, is, is sort of uh, 
something that will help speed things up and catalyze um, this in sort of a quasi trickle down way. Um, I think one of the things in terms of uh, th that I feel like me as, as being a recent graduate of a residency program um, that, that, that we don't really get a lot of is sort of good advocacy training. Um, and, you know, there's all these great organizations like DFA and whatnot that exist. And, you know, for folks who kind of attract to those things, they'll find these organizations. Um, but there really isn't any sort of standard on how to teach residents or, or teach med students on advocacy and like, what are the proper ways to sort of advocate? What are the ways that you can advocate, um, you know, locally, which would be the more sort of immediate things. Um, and places where people can be impactful and sort of demonstrate that you can actually um, use your voice for something. You know, I think I was under the impression when I was a med student, for instance, at one point that I had to wait until I was a full-fledged internist to, you know, um, and sort of had that excuse, that sort of mental block, that cognitive block, which is totally not true. Um, um, you know, now um, I'm an Would you clarify what kind of advocacy you're talking about for individual patients or for legislative action or yeah, for, but, but, I'm and, not sure what you're talking about. Yeah, so I think we learn, I think as med students and, and as trainees, we learn how to advocate. We learn a bit by osmosis, how to advocate for patients. Um, especially when we become residents, we learn how to advocate for patients as we see um, some forms of inequity exist in our system. But I think what we don't learn how to do is how to legislatively advocate, you know, how to, how to write up. Um, to oh, we lost you. Oh, you muted yourself. <laughs> uh, yep. Uh, right, testimonies, um, you know, what are the ways that you could get involved in your local legislature to, um, to advocate for a certain policy, you know, like, um, for example, like right now, uh, one thing that's traveled through the House staff office here is sort of advocating for a local bill um, that's trying to um, uh, uh, secure health care for undocumented individuals in Connecticut. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge deal. And so, you know, it's, it's sort of a question of like, how do we get exposed to these things of advocacy? You know, how do we get trained? You know, and, and I think the problem is that nowadays there's a lot more onus on the individual resident trainee or physician to like really go out of their way and learn how to do these things and then go proceed to have the, the, the uh, courage to do those things. Um, you know, and, and I think, I think, for example, I, I'm, I'm, I think we're, I'm lucky to be here at Yale where there are some people, um, some key players um, that uh, physicians that have sort of created these advocacy uh, um, workshops and things like that. But it's just like, like a lot of these things, it's not like a standard, you know, it's not like a competency. And so, um, you know, I think that's something that's largely missing. So I would love to offer a solution here. Um, <laughs> at my school, so I took a year off to do a master's in public health and health policy and a colleague of mine, really, really a great friend of mine and I did the program together and we just looked at each other like, why don't we all know this? Like, why did it take a master's to understand the basics of insurance and payment and quality, et cetera? Um, so we put together a two week health policy elective that touches on those very things, Ahmed. Um, it outlines some of the basics of our systems and how we came to these places of inequity that we're now trying to like fight against with anti-racism curricula and then offers a bunch of like practical skills around advocacy, how to testify in a hearing, how do you engage with the media, how to leverage social media as a tool for advocacy. We have two different sessions about developing campaigns as physicians. So I'm gonna drop an interest link if people wanna join us, feel free. Um, it's April 12th to the 23rd this year. It happens in April of every year. This is our second iteration of it. And this is, this is exactly what we're trying to do. And so this was a standard part of curricula for us. It's part of our clinical foundations, how to be a doctor class now. Um, but we also offer this advanced elective that's a two week non-clinical elective credit for medical students um, at UCI. And then people who are welcome to join us just for piecemeal participation can. And if they participate in at least 80% of our total lectures, we can offer certificates of completion to take back to their medical schools. Um, another thing that I wanna highlight here though, in thinking about anti-racism curricula, you don't have, just have to talk about racism. 
um, to your point, Dr. Silver, it's about talking about all of the different carceral, punitive, messed up systems that exist um, that push this racist narrative. So in our allyship series, we didn't actually really talk about racism a ton. We talked about community engagement, anti-blackness in medicine, abolition, um, this idea of white culture and white identity. We talked about mentorship and advertising, redlining and social mobility. Um, so we were trying to have people understand that like there are a whole host of other things to talk about when it comes to race than just defining racism. Um, and I think that's a really big part that's missing from existing anti-racist racist curricula that we just spend all our time talking about black people have poor health outcomes. We have to move past that. And that's what both of these two pieces of curricula we're seeking to do. In a health policy space, it's understanding the structures that bred these inequities. And then in an allyship space, it's understanding how racism touches all of these other systems that relate to health and healthcare. Um, and so I would love for y'all to join me. If we wanna add this as one of the resources for people to tap on grace, then we can do that. I don't know if it's really best to situate this in the toolkit document that you sent, but I'd be happy to email. Can you drop your email in the chat? And I'd be happy yeah, to email you. Like, I will. Yeah, more. thank you for sharing that. That's really great. Um, I just wanted to chime in too. Um, so that's open to anyone, correct? Like any medical student, okay. Anyone. Um, okay. It's only really offered for formal registrar credit at my okay. medical school, but we offer certificates of completion if people okay. want to take it back to that's, their Yeah, school. that's great. We do a similar not thing. CME, though. That's one thing we haven't figured out yet. But What'd you say? We're not yet offering CME. That's oh, something. yeah, that would be good too. You could do that, yeah. Um, we do a similar one at, at Georgetown. I just did it actually. Um, they allow the residents to participate as well. So that's really amazing. Really yeah, Kaiser does a really yeah. good job of this um, in California, and George Washington University does a really mm -hmm. good job. Yeah, excellent. Um, I just wanted to call in Sheila. Sheila, did you have something to add? Yeah, thanks. Um, I just didn't want to cut everyone off. Uh, um, I wanted to just point out um, in response to what Ahmed said, I think not to like toot our own hall Arn, but pediatric residency programs have done a lot of advocacy work. And granted, I applied to residency four years ago, but most of the programs I applied to had an advocacy pathway. Um, granted, I was like self-selecting for those, but um, so I do think in terms of graduate medical education, if you're interested in more broad advocacy training and not specific anti-racism curriculum. Um, I think the AAP uh, has a lot of resources on how to build advocacy curriculum and residency programs. And of course, a lot of the resources are gonna be very um, PED specific, but uh, I mean, media training is not, and um, you know, how to have a one-on-one -on -one with your state legislature is not too. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Our programs advocacy track is actually a state track that's funded by AAP. And so um, if you have questions about implementing advocacy pathways, I'd happy to offer that. But I think Kelly, you made a, an excellent point that, you know, an anti-racism curriculum should talk about a lot more than racism. I think one thing that I have found at least at my institution is that Sometimes I think that's true, but then I think sometimes it can be a cop out to avoid talking about racism at all. Um, and so people talk about advocacy work and think it's the same as being anti racist without acknowledging that, like, they are different. Yeah, that's a good point. I would echo that sentiment as well. Um, thank you for sharing the AAP stuff. I put some stuff in the document as well. It's not exhaustive by any means, so there's, I'm sure there's a lot more. Um, in the interest of time, we're having a great conversation, but I just wanted to kind of keep, uh, make sure we finish our agenda. So the next thing is just to briefly mention this potential partnerships with organizations. If you open the agenda, there's um, some places listed there, like White Coats for Black Lives and various institutions. So if you guys have groups or institutions that would want to sign on and be a partner in this, let us know that as well. Um, and then down at the bottom of the agenda, we have kind of, this is the interactive portion. We've been interacting a lot, so this is great. But um, the interactive portion, so you can click on the links in the agenda. The first one will take you to kind of sign up. Um, and I believe 
to sign up for the meeting, you already did this, but Allison can correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Um, and so that kind of has like signing up to like take a pledge to do this, give the letter to your institution, et cetera, things like that. Um, and then again, add to the list. That was one of our activities we also wanted to do. So you guys can go ahead and do that. Um, and then, you know, volunteering to deliver the toolkit to your medical institutions. I think we've talked kind of about the best way to do this. Um, and we can definitely talk more about this. I think the for now, we were thinking the letter would be the way to go. Um, and I just wanted to circle back to what you said about the data. I think that's really great um, and would be really helpful. If you have something to share, you can put that in the document as well. Sorry to keep coming back to the document, but that's super helpful. Um, I know that the medical students at my institution also did that and they're publishing their research as well. And that's probably why it worked the way it did. So that's excellent. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to bring up, just in the interest of time, we can keep talking if you guys want to stay on, but um, the national webinar. So I know we talked about doing a series and I think that's excellent. So I guess what we were hoping you guys could do just for a few minutes is brainstorm kind of people you want in the webinar. If there are certain speakers, you can put them in the chat. We can try to contact them as DFA or you guys can contact them um, and kind of connect with them. Um, but does anybody have any ideas right off the bat? We had um, a webinar in the summer that was kind of on a similar topic. It was a little bit more focused with like gun violence, but um, Dr. Mitchell, he's a physician in Washington, DC, who was uh, the deputy mayor at the time. So he did a really excellent um, kind of panel on that. Um, so any ideas that you guys can think of off the top of your head? Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Silver. Well, Kelly sounds to me like she's, got an amazing program already set up. I'm curious to know how you you fund yourself or, or how you keep it going. And um, maybe we could look over, instead of reinventing the wheel kind of expression, uh, look over what she has and uh, ask her what it would take uh, or, or consider the possibility that she might be the one who who already has a program that we could sponsor. How, how about if I say it that way? <laughs> Love that. Um, yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Kelly. For a question though that I would have for you, Grace, is like, what is the end goal? Um, what is it that you hope participants that tune into this one time or series of webinars leave with? Because I think that would then guide our speaker discussion, yep. because um, right. I have a bunch of names <laughs> about who can yeah. offer a different topic kind of expertise, you know? Uh -huh. But, yeah. but I, I also like that she's offering, you know, a curriculum. Maybe there, yeah. maybe she has this, I haven't seen it, but I, so I've had a brief exposure to you, but so far I'm very impressed. And um, maybe there's a possibility that, that, you know, there's already a product that we could offer in the, this new Zoom world that we're all learning to love or hate, I guess, but <laughs> there's a lot to love about it. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff about it. It provides an opportunity for someone who's put together this marvelous curriculum to share it even one time with every medical school. Maybe there's, you have a two week curriculum. Maybe there's two weeks when all the medical schools would be invited to, to join together. I mean, they'd have to help support such an activity financially, yeah. but that still would be so much more efficient, I'll say it that way, than, than starting from scratch. O Onita, you're, you're a, a big shot in medical school. You wanna speak up? Well, no, not really. I mean, we, <laughs> we have, we have a social determinants of health curriculum, but I think that's different than anti-racism. And, you know, um, speaking to what Sheila discussed, even advocacy is different to anti-racism. Um, anti-racism um, manifests itself, not just in how medical systems and institutions work, but also in day-to-day -day interactions between 
physicians and patients. I think, you know, um, last night's PBS had an excellent segment on how Black women individually have been wronged by the, the, the um, medical system. And it was individual doctors that did this. So, you know, I, I really feel that anti-racism is different than advocacy. It's different than social determinants of health. And um, I, I, I think that's something that our institution really needs. And, you know, I, I wish I had something to add, but I'm really here to learn. But thank you, Marcia. Yeah, and that's exactly why I wanna come back to the question of like, what's our end goal? Um, because if the goal is for people to understand social determinants of health, that's different. If the goal is, and also who's your audience? Um, who is it that you're targeting? So do you have any idea of what that looks like, Grace Allison? Yeah, so I think um, our end goal is kind of just to get this at, into as many institutions as possible. Um, initially, you know, we were focusing more on the anti-racism part of it. Um, and in terms of like the audience for the webinars, you know, we've kind of left that open. We want to get this into residency programs if possible, medical schools, you know, res educating attendings if they if people want to do that as well. So I think it'd be a pretty broad audience. I don't know, Allison, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and Doctors for America, we've been around since 09. Uh, we have 20,000 emails in our database of physician advocates that are just say progressive right of center. We're nonpartisan. Um, we, we would love to be able to help build an audience um, in, for the series, I think is great. You know, you have a webinar. Excuse me, maybe, what did you yeah. say about right of center? Oh, just Doctors for America. We're a non-political organization. I mean, was, we're nonpartisan. We're, we, the, the issues that we focus on, um, including gun violence prevention, um, our immigrant health justice, women's health, substance use disorder, health for all. Um, we have a COVID group that focuses on that. I'm missing one of them, but um, yes. So we're we're a progressive organization advocating for every person in America to have you know fundamental right, fundamental right to equitable, high quality, and affordable health care. And ending health disparities is one of our guiding principles. So whether it's a series the, that we have, that we work with Kelly and her organization, that sounds wonderful. Um, but to help amplify, recreating the wheel doesn't sound great, right? There's a lot of toolkits out there. We want to be able to um, have as many of our membership physicians take whatever toolkit we end up creating or sharing and teaching them how to bring it to their health institution, whether it's their medical school, their residency program, or their employer, and to teach them how to advocate for the training and to help make it happen. There's a couple layers here. Um, there, the, and I guess that, you know, the point of what is the end goal is kind of along these lines, because there's, do we want physicians to know what their racism feels like? Our racism feels like, do we, do we want to be able to understand how we are part of a racist system and know what that feels like so we can act on it or act against it. And I, I mean, to me, I think so. I think yeah. what something that Kelly was saying earlier about sharing a dialogue, sharing collective experiences at, at our national leadership conference last year, we did have a panel that talked about being a doctor while black and the racist treatment that doctors received from their patients or vice versa. Um, and so having a conversation to have a dialogue, maybe that's sort of one of the topics of the, of the web, you know, of the series, you can have it, you could have a theme of different themes each time that talk about a different subject and have people drop in to talk about them with a moderator. Because that's a sort of a slower, a more intensive process than like just getting a, um, a, um, a, um, a curriculum out to med schools, you know, I mean, that's also important, but you're going to, I think you're going to be able to disseminate a toolkit better if people understand what racism is so they're more motivated. And so, you know, it's, it just, yeah. it's, I guess it's sort of chicken and egg here, but I, I'm, um, yeah, I'm, 
curious about. I, I, I have to say the phrase thoughtful pace. I'm doing this amazing workshop called Unbodying White Supremacy. And we're talking about urgency versus thoughtful pace and the idea of trying to go to a goal quickly, which is very white, <laughs> white supremacy, as opposed to sitting with things and really sitting with emotions and so on. And so I just throw that out there as a good way to approach things. Yeah, I mean, DFA is an, a national organization, you know, even though we have 20,000 members, we have five staff. So we do have to go slow to support the work that our members do. And um, the work you all do is really inspiring. But we have given you a lot of different links. We will send out a communication um, tomorrow or the day after that lists out what was in the chat. All these links are, are really valuable. Um, and if people are up for it, to have another conversation with this group and cast a wider net perhaps and continue the conversation in a month or so. I think in terms of next steps for everyone, um, continue to add to our toolkit for now. You can sign up for the various links that are in the agenda. And then um, kind of just brainstorm like how we can best go about this as a, as a larger group. Um, and then we will work on planning another meeting. And that meetings are usually in the evenings during the week. Anybody have any last thoughts, suggestions, comments? Thank you all thank very you much. Everybody. Yeah, thank great. you guys so much. Terrific. It's thank so you much for nice joining. To meet everybody. Yeah, it was Kelly. nice to meet everyone. Thank you for a great conversation. Thanks so much, Kelly, and for everyone else yeah, who made so many contributions, Sarah and Rebecca, everyone who spoke. Really appreciate your thoughts and your involvement. Take care. That was great. We'll see everybody next time. Thank you.